Okay. Um, so, Marcus, are you here? Yes, yes, I am. Thanks, Maya. Great. So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, today we're going to have a special session um, with um, Marcus Burke, Executive Leader, Future Technologies in Australia, NTC. And we have another presenter, another presenter from uh, the Australian uh, federal government, and uh, Nikki Vajarabuha. Marcus, you can correct me for the last yes, name. No, that's, yes, and that's right. Okay. Um, Director, Transport Policy and Technology and Research at the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communication, the Australian Federal Government. And we are very happy to have you here, Marcus. Thank you for joining and for accepting this invitation. Um, and uh, we would like to hear you and hear about uh, the amazing work that we are following after here in Israel um, that you are doing in Australia. And I'll just take frame the discussion that the people that are uh, here today are part of the interministerial committee um, that its goal is to create regulatory framework for the and trial of autonomous vehicles in Israel. Um, and um, thank you. So the stage is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Maya. And uh, I can see Nikki has just uh, joined us as, as well. Um, uh, Nikki, uh, Maya, Maya just introduced you as you were joining in then. Thank um, you. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. I do have a presentation to run through, but I would just invite you to, to jump in and uh, ask any questions as, as I'm going through rather than leaving them till the end. Um, I'm happy to keep it uh, quite informal. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully there's, there's uh, something from the experience in Australia which is, is useful for you in Israel. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. So if everyone can see uh, slides up on screen, great. Uh, and I'm not sure if I can see people sort of raise their hands or put in comments, um, but uh, uh, just jump in if, if you do have a question. Uh, so my name is Marcus Burke. I'm the executive leader for Future Technologies at the, the National Transport Commission in Australia. And as part of that role, I've been leading the program of reforms to support automated vehicles uh, over the last four years or so. Um, I'll be talking to you today about uh, our program um, of work that we've, we've been running, but uh, with a particular focus on uh, recent work on in-service safety for automated vehicles. Uh, so the National Transport Commission, uh, we're a government agency, we're a, a policy reform body, uh, and our role is to, to lead reform in areas of land transport, so that includes road rail and intermodal, uh, and we have had a particular focus on, on new technologies in recent years and how we provide the right framework to support those. Uh, we have a goal in this area that our transport ministers from around the country um, have, uh, have agreed to, which is a goal of end-to-end -end regulation to support the safe commercial deployment and operation of automated vehicles at all levels of automation. Um, we feel, feel it's been really important to get that political support for that goal, which really sets the, the overall objective for our, our program, which we have been working towards. And the reason for that is so that we can get the safety, mobility, productivity and, and environmental benefits uh, for, for all Australians uh, when the technology is, is ready for commercial deployment. Um, so the, the goal is commercial deployment. We do want to go beyond trials and uh, make sure that we can uh, get, those, get those benefits. Um, as I go through, uh, please let me know if there's things that, that aren't uh, relevant for you. I am conscious Australia is a, a federation. Uh, we have a federal political system, which means uh, some powers uh, sit at the state level and, and some at the national government level. Um, that does create some, some different challenges uh, for us. Uh, Australia has been rated as uh, one of the uh, top performing countries uh, in AV regulations uh, by KPMG in, in their reports on AV readiness over the last couple of years, um, which has been great to, uh, to get that recognition. So I might just uh, talk about a couple of concepts um, 
it's probably familiar to most of you, but just um, to ensure we're, we're talking the, the same language in, in terms of the terminology. So uh, we talk about an automated vehicle as being vehicles that include an automated driving system that is capable of monitoring the driving environment and controlling the dynamic driving task with limited or no human input. Uh, so we see automated vehicles as being levels three, four, and five, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, those, and that, uh, and that it's at those levels that we need a different approach to, to regulation. And one of the things we do need to keep in mind is it could be vehicles based on existing models, um, looking very similar to, uh, to light or heavy vehicles today. Um, it could be new vehicle types, and it could be uh, aftermarket, aftermarket devices, um, which are, are retrofitted to existing vehicles. Uh, so we need to think about how the framework supports those different kind of deployment models. Uh, just some other key concepts. We do uh, generally talk about automated vehicles uh, rather than driverless cars or autonomous vehicles, uh, just to be clear that it's different levels of automation. Uh, I'll be referring to the automated driving system as both the hardware and the software that together um, can support the, the driving task. Um, a concept that we have developed in Australia is the, the company that sits behind the automated driving system that is bringing the technology to market, which we've called the automated driving system entity. Uh, and we believe that it's that company that uh, needs to take responsibility for the safety of the automated driving system. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Uh, a key uh, concept in automated vehicles is the operational design domain. So. Uh, that's the scope of operation of the vehicle. Uh, we anticipate that these vehicles won't be able to go anywhere on the road network initially. They'll be limited to certain types of roads or certain road environments um, or potentially certain weather conditions uh, that they can safely operate in. Uh, so that's a, a key limitation that we need to be aware of. Uh, and I'll talk a bit further about the fallback ready users and the dynamic driving task. Uh, the levels of automation Maya, will these be pretty familiar to people in the, the group or is it useful to explain yeah, those? I think so. I think it's not necessary. Okay, great. I'll skip over that. So uh, we there's a lot we, we do know about automated vehicles, but there's obviously a lot we don't know as well. We still don't know exactly when the technology will be ready, um, what applications will be the most successful, um, what the mix of technologies are that will be used, the kind of business models that might emerge, um, whether consumers will actually want to use them or not, how it will change consumer use and behaviour, and hence what the overall impacts on things like road safety and congestion might be. Uh, so that makes it quite challenging to think through uh, what a regulatory framework, what a policy framework looks like uh, with all of those unknowns. So. When we first started looking at this uh, issue several years ago, we looked at you know, what is the problem we're actually trying to solve here and that there were two aspects to it uh, in looking at regulation. Uh, firstly, what might be the, the barriers? Um, so what uh, existing regulations might make automotive vehicles illegal to use on our roads? Uh, and we actually did a, an audit of uh, regulation in, at the state uh, and federal level in Australia, and we actually found um, hundreds of, of provisions um, that could potentially prevent uh, an automated vehicle from operating legally, um, because we have a whole range of legislation that's premised on, on a human driver being in control of the vehicle and, and doesn't work when you, when you take that human driver away. So we need to look at the barriers, but we also need to look at the, the gaps. Um, so what new risks might automotive vehicles create um, that we actually need to manage through regulation that may not be managed by existing uh, legislation and may not be managed by the market? Um, so we need to think through those, those two different lenses. Uh, when we look through the, the legislative barriers, uh, as I mentioned, we actually found um, hundreds of, of issues as we looked across things like road rules, uh, vehicle standards, uh, regulation of heavy vehicles or freight, um, regulation of passenger transport, including things like buses, but also um, taxis and uh, uh, car share. Uh, criminal law, where we have um, offences for things like dangerous driving and uh, regulation of the, the transport of, of dangerous goods. So it, it highlighted to us the, uh, the, the scope of the, uh, the problem that there's actually a huge number of obligations that we, uh, that we target at the driver of the vehicle and we need to make sure that uh, they, they continue to operate 
uh, to manage the, the risks that we're trying to manage with those obligations. Um, when we went through those uh, obligations, they really fell into two different categories. Uh, there are obligations related to the dynamic driving tasks, so the actual driving of the vehicle. So that includes things like falling speed limits, stopping at stop signs, uh, et cetera, that can be controlled by, can be met by the driving of the vehicle. Uh, and so we would anticipate that an automated driving system will be able to perform uh, and meet those obligations. <coughs> But we found there's also a whole range of other obligations that we currently put on drivers today because they're the most convenient party to put those obligations on. And again, these, these may be different in Israel, but uh, we have obligations in our legislation around uh, drivers ensuring that kids in a vehicle have their seatbelts on uh, or ensuring that loads are tied down correctly on a trailer that the vehicle might be towing or that the vehicle is complying with the, uh, the mass uh, restrictions um, for the vehicle. So there's a whole range of obligations that we put on drivers that don't actually relate to the driving of the vehicle itself, uh, but relate to things around the vehicle. So we need to look at these and look at who has responsibility for them and, and how do we maintain the, the intent of, of the law uh, in these scenarios. Um, I might just pause for a moment there if there's any questions on that initial work we did to, to audit existing laws and uh, the kinds of issues that we found. Oh, all right, I'll keep going. Um, one of the other challenges that we found is that uh, the existing uh, paradigms for regulation in this area don't necessarily work for, for automated vehicles. So we currently have very separate regulation for, for vehicles uh, on the, the left-hand side there, and then for drivers on the right-hand side. Uh, so, and again, this is very much based on Australian law. Um, for vehicles, we have an approach at, at first supply when the vehicles first enter the market. Um, uh, I might just ask people to put themselves on mute if, uh, um, if you're not talking, that'd be, that'd be great. I think, um, Ilan, can you put yourself on mute? Uh, so uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we have the, the regulation of, of vehicles. Um, we have regulation at, at first market entry of vehicles, so for, for new vehicles entering the market, um, which is directed at the manufacturer. Uh, but then we have a, a range of standards uh, and uh, roadworthiness requirements uh, whilst the vehicle is operating out on the road network. Uh, and those are largely targeted at the owner of the vehicle. On the, the right-hand side there, we also obviously regulate drivers. Um, we have an approach, again, at, at market entry, if you like, for, for drivers, which is our driver licensing uh, system. And then we, then we have things like road rules uh, to ensure that drivers continue to operate safely uh, whilst they're out on the road. Um, when we have a vehicle with an automated driving system, a vehicle that can actually drive itself, uh, it challenges those existing paradigms because we need to look at elements of all of these different systems uh, to ensure that we have a, a framework that supports the, the safe operation of these vehicles. And in terms of the responsibility, uh, we believe that we need to create a, a new party in the system, uh, separate to the manufacturer, the owner, the human driver, uh, to, that has responsibility for the automated driving system. Uh, and we've turned that the automated driving system entity as again, the, the company that is uh, bringing the technology to market and assuring governments and assuring the public of its safety. Um, we have uh, deliberately not used manufacturer there because the, the company bringing the automated driving system to market may be different from the manufacturer of the vehicle, um, as we're seeing with companies like Waymo who are building automated driving systems but are not building vehicles. So it could be the same as the manufacturer, but we need to recognise that, that that could be different. Um, and again, jump, jump in at, uh, at any time if you have questions. So in approaching all of these issues, uh, we also developed some overall uh, principles to guide our work, uh, including that uh, safety should be the, the key priority uh, that, we are, that we are working towards, um, that we need to provide legal certainty, um, both to industry and to the, the public, uh, that we should be aiming to have the responsibilities on parties are best able to manage the risk 
uh, and that drives some of the thinking in the, the previous screen uh, that uh, you know, we could put the, the obligations for the, the driving of the, the automated driving system on the owner of the vehicle, for example, as having a responsibility, but they're not someone who is actually in a position to really control the risks. It's the company that's developing the technology that can do that. Um, we are aiming to develop uh, an approach that's outcomes-based, um, not prescriptive. Uh, so that uh, we don't have to try and pick and choose winners amongst technologies uh, and try and really um, predict the future because uh, governments are often very bad at, uh, at doing that. Uh, we want to develop a, uh, an approach that's internationally aligned uh, so that we are keeping Australia as part of the global vehicle market and can tap into that market. And an approach that's both technology neutral and business model and application neutral. Um, so that we can support a range of different technologies, applications, um, business models that might emerge over time, uh, again, without trying to predict what they might be ahead of time. Uh, and given that things will continue to change, uh, develop a, 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 a regulatory system that, that is able to evolve and, uh, and change over time. Um, so they're all quite uh, challenging uh, uh, principles to actually put into to practice. Uh, but has uh, helped to uh, to guide the work that we've done. Can I jump in, Marcos, and ask? Uh, sure. Ask... So first of all, um, we did uh, a, a big work on a policy review white paper that you also took part in, and we took a lot of these principles uh, and put them there because we think that it's extremely important uh, way and, and helpful way to look at autonomous driving uh, regulation. Um, so I think that my question, I have two questions. First of all, for the outcome-based regulation, um, if you can, when you, are, when you are moving through with the lecture, maybe you can like put light on that and say, and say that, how can a government shift from prescriptive uh, to outcomes-based regulation? I'm not really familiar with how the Australian government is operating. I'm familiar with the Israeli government. And I think that for the Israeli government, it's a change uh, that needs to be done. And we are all in the process of doing that. So that's um, one comment. And the second comment is um, the how you divided uh, for the first supply and then in service, because right now we are working on the first supply, right? Like how to give a license to an autonomous vehicle, how to make it go on the road. Uh, so that's something that we are pretty more or less very advanced in. But what happens when it's on the road? What's happening when it needs to uh, comply with, um, with traffic uh, uh, orders and laws? That we are still like... Um, struggling with so it will be also nice to hear about the in service or however you define it yes yeah i'll uh, i'll certainly talk about that uh and I, I will talk more about the the idea of outcomes based and i i, I guess the uh that you know, uh, at a high level it's uh you know we want these vehicles to operate safely but we don't want to necessarily tell companies uh, how many lidars need to be on the vehicle or uh, what particular features the vehicle might have so it's it's that sense that we don't want to be prescriptive about uh, the technologies or what the vehicle looks like <clears throat> but have a clear outcome that the vehicle can operate safely on the, on the roads that we're we're trying to get to um, but I will, i'll uh, come back to that in a bit more detail further along all right the the other way that we we looked at the overall uh, program was to try and define the different um, elements of our regulatory system and actually uh, attempt to define what the outcome is that we're working towards. Um, so I won't go through all of these in, in detail, but um, uh, by way of example for uh, first supply uh, that we were just talking about, uh, at first supply, we want vehicles with demonstrably safe automated driving systems uh, able to enter the Australian market. Um, we want to be able to identify the responsible entity and, and set some minimum requirements. Uh, and we want to make sure that the regulator has appropriate powers to address non-compliance. Um, and we found that a useful process to go through to uh, try and uh, define um, a bit more clearly what are the outcomes for each of the, these areas that we're, we're working towards. Um, so we looked at uh, registration and access to roads, um, on-road safety, 
uh, and over the page uh, road rules, uh, civil and statutory liability, um, other uh, transport laws and other state and territory laws that we need to be amended. Um, and uh, through uh, all of that work, we identified six uh, key questions or six key areas that we needed to, to work through. And, and these have been the, uh, the individual reforms that we have been working through over the last three or four years. So um, firstly, how do we support trials of automated vehicles? Um, how do we define who is in control uh, of an automated vehicle? Uh, as we just touched on, how do we ensure that vehicles are safe when they first enter the market? Uh, but then importantly, how do we ensure that they're not just safe on day one, uh, but that they continue to operate safely throughout their life on the road? Uh, and I guess, you know, one of the things we've come to realise is that, that an automated vehicle is actually moving from a product, product to being more of a service, um, given that it will need to be maintained over time um, as the, the road environment changes, as uh, road rules change, um, as cybersecurity uh, threats might change. So it's not a product that can be just introduced and then forgotten about. Uh, it does need to be maintained over time. <clears throat> uh, and we need to have a, a, a regulatory system that, uh, that can support that. Uh, fifth, uh, how do we manage uh, injury insurance uh, for automotive vehicles? Um, and uh, we have existing uh, motor accident injury schemes in, in Australia. Uh, and then finally, managing uh, access to, to data, um, which I'll touch on briefly towards the end. Uh, trials, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on, but we have developed uh, guidelines for automotive vehicle trials um, with some, some basic requirements that companies need to meet, um, having a clear scope, uh, having a safety management plan in place, uh, appropriate insurance and agreeing to provide certain data. Um, and that's been a, a useful um, uh, document to ensure that there's a level of consistency in, in allowing our trials to take place around the country. Uh, the question of who is in control. <clears throat> um, uh, again, we, we go back to this concept of the automated driving system entity that the, the company bringing the technology to market uh, and assuring uh, governments and the public of its safety um, should be considered to be in control of the vehicle and take on the obligations of a driver today. Um, so that is particularly for levels three, four, and five. Uh, levels zero, one, and two continue to be uh, human driven. The human driver is, is in control and has legal responsibility. Um, it is a slightly more complex at level three, but we I uh, believe that the automated driving system entity should be considered in control when the vehicle's operating in automated mode. Um, if there is a handback request uh, to the fallback ready user, um, it reverts to them being a, a level zero, one or two vehicle uh, with the human driver in control. Um, so that it's very clear um, who is actually in control at any point in time um, and that that legal responsibility uh, is, is clear for everyone. Uh, Can we so something, you... something about that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, two questions regarding the the entity, which is a very interesting concept. I think most of maybe you can uh, present yourself before. Oh yes. Okay. So I'm Tamara Lev. I'm from the Ministry of Justice, and I'm um, assisting the Ministry of uh, Transportation in uh, form uh, forming and actually wording uh, our uh, legislation for uh, autonomous um, vehicles these days. Uh, and we're really in the middle of, of writing them. So we are really having these, uh, these questions. And, um, and the question of this entity that is responsible is something that of course we face too. And what I wanted to ask is uh, two questions about that. Um, first, um, in the, in the trials where you have the guidelines, I, you did not, as far as I, I, I understand, you did not have this entity and how, who was the responsible there um, on the thing that you are now passing on to the entity? I'm not sure I'm totally clear uh, understanding where do you put the line on, on what is the responsibility of the manufacturer and the, and the uh, producer and what will start the responsibility of the, of the new entity? Uh, and, and how does it relate to the trials that you were having before that? And the second question, which you just um, talked about, is now how are you uh, exactly uh, making sure that you know who's controlled? Do you have kind of, when you say handback request, that kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of um, information, lights showing? How do you know uh, at this, at the moment when the driving system is shut down and the person starts to drive? 
all, all good questions. So uh, in terms of the first one, uh, um, in terms of how we distinguish the automated driving system entity from the manufacturer, the, the way that we've actually defined it in the legislation is that the automated driving system entity is the manufacturer of the automated driving system component of the vehicle. So we do allow un, under our legislation to have separate approval for components as opposed to the, the whole vehicle. So um, it can be the, uh, the manufacturer of the vehicle, but it can actually be separate. And I guess we'd see it as it's effectively self-selected by the, the, the company that if they want to bring this technology to market and have it approved for use, um, they've got to uh, uh, effectively assign themselves as being that automated driving system entity and, and taking on that, that responsibility and that, and that liability. Um, in terms of how we've done that in, in trials, it has been slightly different in, in different uh, states and territories because uh, some of our states have their own legislation, but it is the, the company that is looking to set up the trial that is effectively taking on uh, that responsibility, the responsibility of, of the drivers. Um, but that has been a, a little bit different in, in different states. Um, the, the question around identifying control um, when there's a handback request. So, I guess in this area, we are looking a bit to, to what's happening at the international level. There is work uh, at the, the UNACE uh, level around standards for um, what's called a, a DSSAD, which is a data safety system for automated driving as a, a device that will be in the vehicle in particular to identify who is in control at a particular point in time, whether the automated driving system is in control um, or, <clears throat> um, or the human driver. So those standards are still being finalised, including the, the interface to that device. So um, we do need to do further work on how an enforcement officer would actually access that data um, to determine who is in control at a particular point in time. But uh, yeah, we're looking to, uh, I guess, ensure that the right people have access to that data from the vehicle rather than having some sort of, you know, lights or signs to, to indicate externally uh, who was in control. Does that address your questions? Um, yes, generally, of course, it raises other questions about this data. <laughs> exactly what is the scope of this data? How, does, how do they transfer this to whom, as, as you said, Mark? It's, yeah, yep. many questions. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can find um, there are draft standards available on the, the kind of data that um, that, that DSSAD will, will capture. Um, there's still, as I understand, discussion on the, on the interface on how um, external parties would actually access that, that data. Um, uh, and yeah, whether that, that might be wireless or, or, or plugging into to the vehicle in some way. Um, that's that's still under development, but that that's obviously going to be a key area. I just right. want to add another um, clarification question, Marcus. The the guidelines for uh, trials they are uh, at the moment currently not uh, enabling driverless pilots, right? It does leave it uh, open for driverless pilots. We haven't seen any t uh, to date in Australia. Um, but it doesn't actually require a, a human driver to, uh, to be in the vehicle, um, just that there's appropriate safety um, mitigations in place for whatever level of automation the vehicle is being run at. Um, but again, we, we haven't actually seen a, a, a fully driverless pilot in Australia yet to date. Okay. All right. Um, I'll talk briefly about first supply because I, I know you've uh, already covered this off, um, uh, but we, we have done some work on uh, the, the policy which uh, uh, Nikki and, and uh, the, the Commonwealth Department are now implementing into, into legislation. Uh, and that is that there will be a self-certification approach with uh, 11 safety criteria that co companies will, will need to provide evidence against. Um, we did base these uh, largely on the US federal uh, policy um, with the key difference that that, that policy is, is voluntary, um, whereas this will be mandatory for, for companies uh, looking to bring automated driving systems in. Um, and we did um, 
tailor some of the criteria um, for the Australian um, environment, um, uh, including obviously complying with the Australian road rules um, and that uh, the vehicle can clearly operate in the Australian road environment. So I won't go through all of these in, in detail, um, but we have again tried to leave it open to a range of different vehicles and technologies and um, business models, um, but that these should be the basic safety, basic areas of safety that companies should be looking to cover before bringing a vehicle to market. <coughs> the other element uh, that we did include, which is different to that US policy is obligations on uh, on the entity, so on the automated driving system entity. Uh, so we raised three, uh, three obligations in particular, uh, data recording and sharing, uh, that the company should have a corporate presence in Australia so that they can effectively be sued uh, in Australian courts, uh, and that they meet some minimum financial requirements uh, so that they're demonstrating that they can provide that ongoing support to uh, the automated driving system in Australia. Um, and that they're you know, effectively a, a fit and proper um, uh, party to, to be able to, to support it. So uh, we feel those are very important to make sure that you know, a company isn't just um, bringing devices into the, the market and then, and then leaving. They've got to be prepared to provide ongoing support um, to ensure that they can continue to operate safely. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I wanted to ask about the data recording and sharing. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, my name is Etty Liebman, and I'm too from the Ministry of Justice, and I'm part of the team that is working about the tort and insurance aspects. Okay, great. And uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, uh, recording and sharing the data, because as we understood, there is going to be so much data, maybe too much data. Yep. And uh, we were thinking about this subject and we were wondering about which data should we ask to save and share uh, who's have, who has to be part of a discussion about what data to save and share and even about the um, way it makes uh, dangerous uh, to the people who want this data and what should we demand the, how should we demand to the companies to save it? So can you say a couple of words about what uh, the companies have to save and what do they have to share and how? Yeah, sure. And we've got uh, the, the document that's pictured up on screen. We've got more of a description of that in there. I, I guess the key focus is data around safety so that the company would be recording any safety incidents that, uh, that took place with their, their system, um, including um, uh, any near misses, uh, so that the, the regulator could uh, uh, come in and uh, effectively audit the company to uh, identify potential issues and uh, seek an explanation of, of how the company is managing the, the safety risks. Um, so it, it is really focused on, on the, the potential safety incidents rather than requiring the company to save, you know, the, the gigabytes of data that, that each vehicle will record each day. Um, it's, it's, it's really focused on those safety issues. And they, and they are the one, so but you don't say in advance what are the safety issues and what kind of data. They decide by themselves. It's that's a that's right. Keep or not? Yeah, that's right. Because um, again, we're we're trying to make it um, neutral as to you know things like the the technology. So the data that Waymo will gather with their lidars will be different to the data that Tesla gathers, given that they only use cameras. So we didn't want to be prescriptive about the the kinds of data but that it should be clear that they should uh, uh, save and record data around any uh, safety incidents that they find, um, which is partly to ensure that they're, they're monitoring those safety incidents appropriately and, and uh, addressing them, um, and that, they, uh, that, that, that that data can be checked by a regulator if required. And for how long do they need to keep the data? Uh, I, I, 
I can't recall off the top of my head what we finished up as the uh, the, the timing for it. I, I think what we proposed actually is that um, uh, the company actually, as part of this, that uh, they they uh, effectively propose as part of their application what data that they will record, which is again focused on the the safety uh, uh, safety issues um, and how long they will store it uh, for. So I think you know we typically have seven years for for those kind of corporate requirements in in Australia, um, but we're trying to as far as we can put these obligations back on industry to to determine how they should best meet them. Thank you. Thanks. So there's no other uh, questions. We'll move on to the question of in-service uh, safety. Um, so again, we we want to make sure that the vehicles uh, aren't just safe on on day one uh, when they're first introduced, um, but they continue to, to operate safely throughout their life on the road, which could be five years, ten years, uh, or even longer. Um, we had a look at who should have responsibility for that, that safety um, and the responsibilities of the, the automated driving system entity, but also um, other, other parties, including the owner and the operator and uh, executive office, offices of the, the ADSC. Um, and we also had a look at um, how we can achieve national consistency um, because uh, in-service safety in Australia is, is generally managed at a, at a state level um, and who the, who the regulator should be. Um, and when we were talking earlier about um, outcomes-based regulation and, and the concept of an ADSC, um, when we in initially looked at these issues, we were trying to learn from uh, other areas of transport like rail and aviation, uh, which already have a lot of automation uh, and which have more of a, a safety management uh, approach um, rather than the more prescriptive approach, which has uh, traditionally been taken in, in road transport. Um, and try to learn from the, uh, the safety obligations and uh, the kinds of regulators that are, are used in those areas, uh, where the focus is more on the, the companies managing the risk uh, and the regulator, um, when necessary, being able to go in and, and check their safety systems and ensuring that they are mitigating the risks appropriately, uh, rather than you know, what we have in road transport of uh, police and enforcement officers at the roadside, you know, checking people's speed and, and focused on those more prescriptive requirements. So <clears throat> we uh, ha have done uh, work over the, the last uh, two years um, looking at this issue. Um, we had some initial policy uh, agreed in June last year um, by our, our transport ministers um, of some of the key elements of uh, this in-service safety approach. Um, so that we would have a, a single national approach uh, and a, a national regulator, uh, and that that would be supported by a general safety duty. And I'll, I'll talk in a moment what we mean by that general safety duty, but we, we felt that was, a, that was an important element. Uh, in terms of the, the national regulator, uh, it's important in Australia because we, uh, uh, in service uh, safety is currently regulated at, at the state level, um, so it is a change to our current practices to, to have a, a national regulator in this area. Um, but we felt that was important given, given that this regulator is going to be uh, quite different uh, and be uh, regulating a, a different cohort to uh, what the current road transport regulators uh, do, which is focused on drivers and individual owners of vehicles. Uh, this regulator will be focused on regulating large multinational corporations um, who are bringing these technologies to market. Um, so it requires a, a different style of regulator and uh, different skill sets for the uh, uh, for the people who work there. Uh, so the the general safety duty. Um, again, this this is really the the key example of uh, taking a an outcomes based approach or a principles based approach rather than a, a prescriptive approach. So uh, the wording of the, uh, at the the top here, the legislation hasn't been drafted yet. So this is just um, indicative uh, wording. Uh, but the, the general safety duty would be along the lines of an ADSE must ensure so far as is reasonably practical, that its ADS is safe when used for a purpose for which it was designed, manufactured, supplied or installed. So uh, we have similar style general safety duties in other uh, transport safety regimes, um, including things like uh, rail and, and aviation. 
Uh, it's also, uh, we have similar obligations in, in workplace health and safety. Uh, the test of so far is reasonably practical um, is uh, one that again is used in those, those other areas uh, and is, is well understood through, through case law in, in Australia. Uh, we feel that's uh, important as uh, providing that um, overarching um, safety uh, purpose um, that uh, companies can't uh, avoid meeting. Um, but it also provide, provides them with a lot of flexibility as to how they meet that safety outcome by avoiding getting into uh, prescribing you know, certain features of the vehicle or, or certain technologies that it must have. So uh, the kinds of things that it would uh, require an ADSC to do is uh, remedy any safety defects, um, adapt its ADS to changes over time. Uh, importantly, as an organisation, ensure that it has appropriate uh, resources uh, to manage safety uh, and that it complies with all of its regulatory requirements. Uh, so the, the general safety duty, uh, it, it's, it works best where you're, you're regulating uh, corporations who have the, the resources to, to manage these issues rather than individuals, uh, but it does move towards that uh, more risk management approach um, that the companies effectively have to identify the key safety risks of their operations and ensure that they have appropriate mitigations in place to, uh, to support those, uh, uh, to, to manage those risks. So I might just check if there's any questions on that, because that's, that's quite an in, important concept for, for our regime. So oh, just one clarification, the ADC, is it the company? What is the entity that we are talking about? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So it will need to be a, a corporation and we've said it must be a corporation uh, based uh, in Australia. So it can't be a, an overseas uh, entity, um, but it, it, it does need to be a corporation so that it is a, a legal entity that, uh, uh, can take responsibility and, and effectively be sued in court. Um, so you, you hear occasionally people talk about, you know, that the computer takes on the obligations of the driver or the software does, but you know that doesn't that doesn't make sense. It needs to be uh, a legal person that can actually take on those legal responsibilities. Are there other I have a questions on that? Can I ask another question? A yeah, short of course. one. Just, I hope, as you see it in the future, the automatic vehicles are going to be uh, private, like vehicles today, or it's going to yep. be a driving as a service. Yeah, it's so, it's a it's a really good question. Um, it would be much easier to regulate as a service than as a um, as privately owned vehicles. I, I think the the privately owned scenario is the much more challenging one. Um, but certainly, you know, no one is prepared to say people can't own their own cars anymore at this point. Um, you know, we do need to leave both, um, both options open. Um, I think we do need to be careful as we're working through the regulation on the effect on the market. So the more we do increase the, the safety requirements, um, and the requirements to, to monitor and, and have control of the, the vehicles by, by the ADSE, I think the, the more it will push companies towards that, um, uh, that, that passenger service model rather than selling, um, uh, selling vehicles to private individuals. Um, it, is a, it will be a challenge for companies if they sell vehicles to private individuals with an automated driving system um, because they will need to continue to monitor the automated driving system to make sure that it's operating safely, um, but it's not entirely within their control. So we need to frame the law to make sure that that balance is appropriate, um, that if an individual owner of a vehicle just doesn't maintain their vehicle or, or modifies it in a dangerous way, um, that the, uh, the, the company that produced the technology um, isn't held liable for things that uh, are beyond their control. Um, but they will need to um, they will need to continue to, to monitor the operation of the automated driving system to, to make sure that it's running safely. Um, so yeah, in short, we we want to leave the uh, the, uh, the regulatory system open to to both those potential deployments of 
uh, fleets and, and privately owned vehicles. Uh, but we do need to be careful about the influence we're having over the market in, in how we regulate. But um, is there a view in Israel about the, uh, the likely deployment models? I think that we have Yakov Shemtov from Ministry of Transportation. Maybe he can uh, relate if he's um, on board. But um, if not, then I'll say that for the moment, our bill is talking about a fleet model. Right. Uh, as we, you know, as time goes by, we see vehicles like Tesla that just entered Israel and other vehicles that maybe have now um, only like ADES technologies, but in the future, as the cars will be more and more software based, maybe yep. we won't have a choice but to enable those kind of things. And this is also something we need to take in consideration. Hava, you want to say something? Yes, I have a Reuveni from the legal department, the Ministry of Transport. Uh, the way we see things today, we're talking of uh, mobility as a service. Yeah. We don't think, uh, definitely the bill we are preparing these days is referring to it, to auto autonomous vehicles as a service, but also for the long term, that we, that's what we expect. Of course, we are going into a trial period. We will be learning. But uh, the vision as it is today is for a service and not for privately owned vehicles. Yeah. Thanks. So that, you know, that certainly, you know, fits with, with my view as well. I, I think the business case for privately owned vehicles is going to be difficult for, for it to stack up if people need to pay an extra, you know, 50,000 US on top of their vehicle to have an automated driving system that can maybe only drive itself on freeways and not the rest of the, the road network. It's, it's going to be uh, uh, difficult for that to stack up. But if you can manage the cost by running a, a fleet or, or um, using it for freight, then uh, the business case is, is much clearer. If we consider it not only a problem of costs uh, for purchase and, or for upkeep, but also the effect on the, uh, the crowding the roads yeah, with yep. autonomous vehicles, a, a five-year-old could take be take driven, take himself by car to kindergarten. Yep. Uh, I we don't see that as something we want happening, as yep. far as even as far as the uh, congestion, uh, congestion, the crowd in the roads. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Marcus. Yes. Okay, my name is Jacob uh, Jakub Shemtov. I'm, I'm the head of uh, technology and innovation department at, at the Ministry of Transport. Um, my, my responsibility is from, from you know, the, the, the technical uh, side of, of the autonomous cars. Uh, as, as, uh, first of all, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry for joining late uh, your presentation. Uh, uh, ju just from what, I'm uh, from what I understand, uh, uh, the companies will have to, to bring a lot of information and, and they, they will have to assure that, that they looked in every issue. Uh, and, but finally, as I understand from your presentation, uh, it, it's some kind of self-certification. Uh, I mean, yes. the companies will have to say, well, we looked over mm -hmm. and finally we, we uh, believe that the, 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 the autonomous cars level four or five, uh, by the way, we are thinking of, of level four uh, these days, um, is, is, is safe to drive on, on public roads. Yeah. Um, this is something that in Israel, it's, it's quite a, a problem. Uh, didn't you, haven't you uh, think about, about some and I'm, I'm speaking about the, the self-driving uh, system. Uh, didn't you uh, thought, th think about um, bringing some, some uh, 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 requirements or checks or testing that the car will have to pass before giving the approval the, the Ministry of Transport approval to go on, on public roads. Uh, we, we are thinking now, um, um, we are trying to come up with, uh, 
regulatory simulator will check some some kind of of uh, of um, um, Coefficient. driving scenarios. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Driving scenarios. Yeah. Driving scenarios. Thank you. Uh, and and I'm thinking if if this is something that you already thought about or. Well, yeah, it, it certainly was an, an area of discussion. I, I guess the, there's a, a couple of challenges, you know, one that the scenarios are going to be very different for a low speed shuttle versus a, um, a heavy vehicle that's designed to uh, operate at level four on freeways, um, for example. So trying to design a set of tests that's applicable for um, any uh, application and any deployment scenario is going to be very, um, very tricky. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to have a set of tests that's also uh, comprehensive uh, enough. Um, you know, we've, we've seen with, uh, you know, companies operating in, in the US that they're doing um, millions and millions of miles uh, out on the, on the road and, and find all sorts of scenarios uh, through that. Um, you know, uh, can we develop a really a comprehensive set of scenarios that provide some assurance around the, the safety of the operation of the vehicle? Um, it, it will be quite difficult to, to, uh, to, to have a catalogue that, that is truly comprehensive um, and, it, and it may change over time as, as the risks change. So I guess the, the, the idea here is to put it back onto the, uh, the company bringing the technology to market that they will have to do their own testing to, to assure themselves it's, it's part of the, the evidence that they'll, they'll effectively have to provide um, to satisfy themselves that uh, the vehicle is safe to operate. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions? I might keep moving, but um, thank you for all the questions and, and do um, please continue to, to jump in. Uh, so we believe that a, a general safety duty um, will provide confidence to the, to the public, but also provide that flexibility to industry that, um, and, it, and it allows the technology to evolve over time. Um, the companies can uh, improve their systems and uh, add new features uh, as long as they're, um, they're, they're meeting that general safety duty. Um, it does support companies who already have high levels of safety and, and, and strong processes. Um, it focuses on outcomes of safety rather than, than inputs to, to the system. Um, it does reduce the need for, for prescriptive requirements around particular features of the, of the vehicle. Uh, again, supports a range of, of applications and operational design domains, uh, and it ensures appropriate responsibility um, by the companies, um, and importantly, by the executives. Um, so I haven't talked about in detail, but our, our ministers have also agreed that there should be uh, liability uh, on the executives of, of these companies, um, that they have a, a, a due diligence uh, obligation. Uh, to ensure that they they are managing the safety risks appropriately, um, so that uh, that is that is separate to the the obligation on the corporation. So we've done uh, uh, since we had agreement some of those key features. We've done uh, further work looking at uh, I guess more detailed issues that sit underneath. <coughs> um, so in addition to the general safety duty, there will be um, some more specific uh, duties on the ADSE that, that sits underneath, including things like uh, record keeping um, of safety incidents. Um, we've tried to look at how we manage the transfer of ADSE responsibilities. So what happens when they uh, exit the market, um, whether uh, through a merger or acquisition or, or because the ADSE became bankrupt, um, how do we manage those scenarios? Uh, we've looked at uh, modifications, so uh, we anticipate that these systems will be modified over time to increase their operational design domain um, and potentially to, to add new features. Um, so how do we manage those modifications? Uh, and that actually also includes how do we manage um, aftermarket installations of automated driving systems? Um, so how do we uh, manage an automated driving system which is added to an existing vehicle in the fleet? 
Um, that could be through a software update as, as Tesla is suggesting that they will do, or it could be through um, fitting a, a, a device or a series of devices in the vehicle. Uh, so how do, we, how do we manage the safety risks there? Um, we've had a look at the in-service regulators uh, functions and, and their relationships to, to other regulators, uh, including the first supply regulator. Um, and it's really ensuring that they have the um, appropriate functions and, and then exploit the appropriate powers um, to, to gather data um, in particular around any safety issues. Um, we started work on, on roadside enforcement. There will be further work that's required there uh, to, uh, to, to look at, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, how an, an officer at the roadside will actually uh, gather data from an automated vehicle uh, to check who is in control at a particular point in time. Um, we do want to move from uh, roadside enforcement focused on uh, infringements and, and, and minor offences uh, to using those as uh, potential indicators of a breach of the, the general safety duty. Uh, if an enforcement officer uh, finds a, an automated vehicle is going through a, a red light, for example, um, we don't just want to give a, a ticket to um, uh, to the automated driving system entity, we want that to uh, potentially trigger an investigation uh, to see if there's actually a broader issue across the whole fleet um, of those vehicles. Um, so that uh, link between uh, roadside enforcement and observation of issues uh, and investigations by the regulator is, uh, is very important. Uh, we also did some further work on, on data exchange, so looking at um, what data this regulator needs to, to capture uh, and have access to, both from uh, uh, what is provided at first supply, um, what they can access from, um, from ADSEs over time. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the legislative implementation approach, which I, I won't go into here because it's, it's probably of more relevance for, uh, for the Australian system. Um, I did just want to touch on that uh, that point around modifications, and I'll, I'll open it up for further questions. Um, <clears throat> so we saw um, modifications could come in several forms. So uh, the first one at the top there in, in red, that uh, an ADSC, when they have a vehicle in the market, say a level uh, three vehicle, uh, they could modify it to either increase the level of automation, so to change it from level three to level four, or to expand the operational design domain. Um, so we need to look at um, uh, how we, we manage that and, and, and whether there's a role for the regulator uh, in uh, approving those changes. Uh, but we also need to look at uh, companies who are not uh, ADSEs um, who might want to uh, modify a conventional vehicle to become an AV and uh, how we would manage that scenario. Um, if we want to, allow, want to allow that. So again, that could be a conventional vehicle manufacturer like a, a Tesla, um, who's uh, modifying their existing vehicles through a software update. Um, it could be companies that are developed to, uh, to retrofit existing vehicles uh, to actually install an automated driving system. And you know, we could anticipate that happening with, uh, with trucks, uh, for example, uh, where companies may look to, uh, to do that for the, those kind of commercial vehicles. Uh, so how do we uh, how do we manage that uh, different point of entry uh, for ADSEs into the market um, that don't come through the the standard first supply approach? Uh, and then finally, that you know, we may have individuals who look to uh, to modify a conventional vehicle to become an AV. So you know that someone could order a device over the internet and plug it into their vehicle, and off they go down the road. So. Um, you know, we've proposed that we just prohibit those kind of um, backyard uh, modifications, um, uh, that it should only be uh, where there's a, a company that can um, manage the safety appropriately, uh, that we should allow those, those kinds of installations of automated driving systems. So that was quite a lot of um, information, but I'll just pause um, for a moment there if there's any questions. and whether these uh, are the kinds of issues that you're uh, looking at uh, in your in-service work in Israel. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I'll just uh, ask a small question and then we'll open to 
um, to the participants uh, if they want to ask you also uh, their questions. Um, you were talking about a regulator, who should be the regulator of these things. Yeah. And we would love to hear more about that. Are you considering a dedicated regulator? Is it going to be something within Ministry of Transportation or a special division there? Or um, also about like the separation between the in-service regulator and first supply regulator? Are they not the same person or entity? So um, that's interesting for, for me. And I think that's probably for the rest of the people here. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we, we have looked at some of those issues. So uh, it, it could be the same as the first uh, supply regulator. That's, that's certainly possible. It's, it's partly due to um, our system in Australia where first supply is at the national level and uh, in-service regulation is at the state level that we've actually looked at those as, as two, separate, um, two separate roles, but they could potentially be put together. So I guess I'd make that point at the start. Um, we are still looking at, I, I guess, the level of independence and uh, the governance of, of this regulator. So it could form part of an existing department or it could be a, a standalone uh, entity. Um, I guess the key thing uh, for us is the kinds of skills and experience you would need in such a, a regulator that, um, you know, we see it as uh, people who are experienced with uh, safety management systems. Uh, and can go in and you know audit a major corporation to look at how they're they're managing safety and the processes that they have in place, uh, and make some judgments about whether those are mitigating the risks appropriately. So you know that's probably more skills again that we have in in rail or aviation rather than necessarily in, in uh, road transport today. Um, so. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess part of the thinking of, of having it new is because it needs to take this kind of different approach that you don't want to um, necessarily give the function uh, to an area that's um, traditionally uh, uh, had a had a different role. Um, so that there haven't been any any final decisions about where that regulator should should sit. Um, I guess the other key part of it, and particularly when we talk about setting up a new regulator and a new function is we anticipate it will be quite small to, to begin with, um, given initial deployment of uh, automotive vehicles will be quite limited. Uh, it will be a small number of, of companies in, involved. Um, we anticipate it will only require a, a, a small office uh, to begin with, but uh, have the ability to grow over time as the, the number of vehicles increase and the, uh, uh, the, the, the regulatory challenge increases. Um, in terms of powers and functions, um, you know, we, we talk about that uh, in uh, some of our, our documentation um, so that there's a role in uh, education uh, and, and guidance for industry um, in addition to a, a kind of stricter regulatory role um, and that we have the appropriate powers to um, uh, provide a range of different approaches for the regulator with industry. So that uh, the regulator wouldn't jump straight to a, a, a major fine um, if a, a safety issue took place, that there would be a range of options, including uh, things like um, improvement notices or uh, orders that um, the, uh, the regulator could, uh, could provide uh, to ensure that the focus is on the company fixing the safety issue um, rather than jumping straight to punitive uh, action. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, sure. And I'll just, um, I'm checking if we have people from the IL police. I see Shlomo Luz, if he's listening. Um, if he'll give yes, me. Yeah, so I wanted to ask how does this regulator um, is uh, conducting or connecting with the, with the role of the police? And how do you see the police integrating into this uh, effort? Yeah, so we, we have had a lot of uh, discussions with uh, with police, and they're obviously very interested in understanding what data they they can access, and uh, want it to be very clear what they need to do uh, at the roadside if they they find an issue. Um, we think the role of police is going to be really critical in this area because they're the ones who are going to be observing uh, and dealing with safety issues, uh, and also be the the first responders at at, at crashes. Um, we are looking at um, potentially a, a requirement for ADSCs to produce 
uh, what we're calling an enforcement protocol um, so that the companies, uh, again, bring the technology to market, uh, are setting out clearly how enforcement officers should interact with their, their vehicles um, so that it's very clear for, for police um, how they can do that uh, in, a, in a way that's safe. Um, so I think police will have a, a really important role in uh, particular identifying safety issues that they observe on the road uh, and then as, as first responders at, at crashes uh, and helping to, to identify the, uh, the issues that, that may have caused a crash. Thanks. Other questions? Yako? Yeah, speaking about uh, the regu regulator, well, the companies, as, as, as we said, uh, uh, they will have to bring a lot of information about the, the test and the checks that they, 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 they uh, have made. Uh, finally, uh, the regulator will have to understand if, if the information is, um, is, um, is good enough and, and the vehicle is safe. Is it going to, uh, um, uh, who is going to check the, the, the information? Is it going to be uh, through a, a, a technical commission or something, some, something like that? Uh, so, uh, and uh, Nikki, feel, feel free to jump in here if there's anything to add from a, a first supply perspective, but, um, uh, I would anticipate that the, the regulator will, will not be going and seeking to check every element of the, the evidence that the companies um, provide at, uh, at first supply. Um, they'll be seeking to, to you know, ensure some legitimacy to, to what's been provided and that the companies uh, have clear processes in place um, and that they have clear controls on the, the quality of the products that they're producing so that um, each uh, unit meets the same uh, standard uh, that they're that they're proposing, um, but no, it's it's not proposed that uh, the the regulator would be going out and you know testing individual vehicles or you know checking on the accuracy of their lidars or you know any of those more technical elements um, that they would take the evidence at, at face value and unless there's a, a reason not to. Which means going back to what I, say, I said, it, it's it's going to be a pure uh, self certification, and you are going to to get the um, the their certification and just uh, give them the approval to go on public road. Yep. Yeah. So it it is putting a lot back onto the the companies looking to bring the technology to market. Um, but as part of, I haven't gone into, but as part of the general safety duty, there would be very high fines for um, for major safety issues, in, including potential jail for executive officers of those companies. So, um, you know, there's a there's a big stick at the at the end if uh, companies uh, aren't aren't doing the right thing. Okay. No, it's it's a big question in, in Israel. Is are going to if, if we are going to to uh, to think about that that approach. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly a challenge, and I, I guess it's again partly driven by the challenges. If you wanted to, um, you know, have government one hundred percent assured of the safety of all of these systems before you allow them into the market. Um, that's going to be a major challenge for government to develop the appropriate uh, standards and to actually go out and, and do the, the testing around that. Um, again, given the varieties of, of technologies that will come in and, and the varieties of, of applications that they might be used for. Yeah. So I guess the, the point is just the, the alternative is, is not without challenges as well. Thanks, Jaco. Any other questions? Can I, can I ask you, are you looking at um, issues around uh, modifications and, and aftermarket installations of, uh, of automated driving systems uh, in, in your work? Well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. I mean, the, the autonomous cars will have to to, to change the, uh, the the variety of, of the, the the computers there once in a while, and yep. we we will have to to 
put you know the the uh, the our requirements for how how the 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 companies are going to change the the versions uh, without you know without um, making uh, putting a, a risk in in in, uh, yep. in the new in the new version. And, and again, we'd see part of that is about the companies demonstrating that they've got the right processes in place to manage those um, software updates and that they have appropriate testing uh, in place. Um, because yeah, we, we fully expect these aren't going to be static uh, systems because they, they, they can't be. The road rules will change over time. Um, the, the makeup of uh, road users might change as things like e-scooters get uh, introduced. Um, the infrastructure and the road environment will, will change over time um, and uh, cybersecurity risks will, will change. So um, there will need to be um, ongoing development of these systems to ensure that they continue, can continue to operate safely, even if companies aren't expanding the, uh, the operational design domain. And the question is, is how they are going to uh, to put new versions? Is it, is it going to be over the air? If if yes, we will have to uh, to uh, to be sure that from this uh, from the cybersecurity uh, point of view, we we don't have a, a, a risk there. Yep. So we did have. Sorry, I'm just going to jump back quickly. Um, uh, amongst the safety criteria at first supply, um, one of the criteria, uh, number eight that we've got there is the installation of system upgrades. So we're asking companies to demonstrate up front that they have a process in place to safely manage those upgrades over time. Because um, again, we those, they'll, they'll just have to do upgrades at, uh, at certain points. So um, yeah, we would anticipate that most of those will be over the air um, updates. There may be occasions where um, hardware needs to be changed, but um, again, as we've seen with companies like Tesla, um, uh, a lot will be done through uh, through over the air updates. All right, if there's not any other comments, I'll jump on to uh, motor accident injury insurance. So. Um, we have in Australia um, compulsory uh, third party insurance. Um, it's different in each state, which makes it a, a little bit uh, complicated, but effectively um, any registered vehicle needs to have uh, insurance um, for injuries that might be caused. Um, and so the, those schemes then cover uh, injuries that are, are caused in, in any crashes. Um, again, there's some, some differences in uh, in coverage and, and, and limits across different states and territories, but they they all have uh, a compulsory third party injury insurance. Um, we spent uh, quite a lot of time talking to insurers and uh, and others uh, about this issue and and the principle that uh, our ministers, uh, our transport ministers, agree to is that um, no person should be worse off financially or, or procedurally if they are injured by a vehicle whose automated driving system was engaged. Uh, than if they are injured by a vehicle controlled by a human driver. Um, so that what that means is that it shouldn't matter who was driving the vehicle, that if you're injured in a crash, um, you should be covered uh, in the future in the same way that you're covered today. Um, so that will mean practically for those injury insurance schemes that they will need to ensure that their, their coverage includes uh, crashes involving an automated vehicle. Um, uh, in addition to human-driven vehicle, uh, human-driven vehicles, um, we do have some legislation that references human drivers, some insurance legislation, so that will, will need to be amended. Um, that was uh, uh, an almost majority uh, view, um, and it insurers uh, supported that along with with driver groups and um, and car companies. Um, these vehicles are expected to be safer, but they they will still have risks. Um, but generally there was, there was a view that existing schemes um, should cover these uh, vehicles, um, provided there's the appropriate safety, system, safety regulation in place um, to make sure that they, they are um, operating safely. Um, there was a view by uh, one of our, our states that uh, there was a concern that this would be uh, effectively um, uh, subsidising uh, multinational corporations by by covering some of their risk um, 
but the 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 broader view was that uh, this was important to to give confidence to consumers as as well as to industry. Um, and if there were major issues with particular companies, um, they could potentially be pursued by those insurers um, or pursued by the the safety regulator. Um, so I'll just pause to see if there's questions there, because I, I think it was mentioned earlier that you are looking at insurance at the moment as well. Yeah, I think if Effie, yeah, there she is. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask one of the questions that we were thinking about is what would happen in a situation when no insurance company would want to sell insurance to this kind of uh, cars because it's too new, because they don't know what the risk. So we were thinking if we need to say something about it or we should just give the, the market do his own. Uh, so I wanted to ask if you were thinking about these questions or if the insurance company, uh, which are private, uh, had to say something about it. Did they want to insure the, this kind of car? Did they say it's gonna take time till they're gonna insure? sell insurance to them after they will know uh, if they're safe enough? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yes, it is It is a challenge. The, the systems we've got in uh, Australia, we actually have uh, some states that have government insurance systems. So um, everyone uh, pays their insurance into a, a, a government uh, agency uh, who then covers uh, injuries in, in any crash that, that takes place. Um, but there are other states where uh, it's private insurers, but it's it's mandatory. So you have several providers, but in order to register your vehicle, um, you have to have that, that motor accident injury insurance as part of it. Um, so we found that those uh, private insurance companies were supportive of this approach. Um, they were concerned about um, what it meant for... Um, their kind of pricing uh, over time because they, like everyone else, are struggling to quantify what the risk is and um, how to price these uh, systems. Um, but they thought um, particularly early on when these are going to be uh, a small percentage of the fleet, um, they should be safer than uh, humans, um, that uh, they would effectively um, be covered off appropriately in the broader pool of insurance um, that they have with uh, across the whole vehicle fleet. Um, so it's something that uh, they supported doing this uh, initially, uh, but that we'll need to review it over time because uh, it may be different um, uh, when these vehicles are 95% of the fleet rather than 5% of the fleet, you may need to look at a, a different approach. Um, Thank you. I have a question. Did you think about putting a, a requirements to the companies um, such as uh, safety level or, or reliability level of, of the cars? Well, for sure we are going to, to get to, to have um, accidents and injuries uh, coming from the from the, uh, the driving of, of uh, autonomous cars on, on public roads. Um, we are thinking, uh, for, uh, at least for the beginning, to think about uh, numbers of injuries per, let's say, per um, uh, kilometer that yep. the, the government uh, is going to uh, to ask uh, or, or to, to, to put, a, to put a, as, as, a, as a minimum level, or sorry, maximum level. Yeah. So, um, yes, we have had some of those discussions about, you know, broadly what the metrics are that, um, that we should use. And I think, um, you know, there may be others who, who are more aware of this, but I'm not aware of clear metrics at an international level that you could actually uh, use to assess um, uh, different automated vehicles to determine if vehicle A is safer than, than vehicle B. Um, as you're probably aware in the US, they seem to largely be using uh, with their trials of how frequently the system handbacks control to the safety driver and, and how often that happens uh, per, per kilometer or how many miles uh, per, per handback. Um, uh, there's been, there was some work by um, Rand uh, a couple of years ago that estimated to get you know, a, a true idea of whether 
automotive vehicles uh, cause fewer deaths than human driven vehicles, you would actually need to drive them for hundreds of years because uh, deaths are such a rare uh, occurrence per kilometer um, that you would just need to have an extraordinary number of, uh, of, of kilometers driven to, to actually have um, some reliability ar around that, that metric. So um, <clears throat> yeah, as, as far as I'm aware, there's not, any really clear metric that we we could use if if we wanted to, I think it's in an area where hopefully industry will will develop some of those clearer metrics over time. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not sure what they they would be at, at this stage um, that we could could actually use. You know, I'm asking that because uh, as as we said, sure we are we are sure that a day will come. And and the first uh, injury or death will, will will be, and I'm I'm thinking from our side, uh, are are we going to stop the the uh, the driving of of this uh, mo uh, model? Are we going to uh, to, uh, to keep? Uh, um, I mean, uh, giving them the the approval to go on, and so so. I don't know what would be. I mean, on our side, I'm afraid from. I'm, I'm really afraid from this uh, uh, point. Well, yeah. we, we will have to 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 uh, to stop and think of of going on with with the project. Yeah, and I just on the the suggestion around a metric for um, you know injuries per you know hundred thousand kilometers or, or or whatever it is. I, I think. Governments would also want to be careful about how they set that because they don't want to, you know, they want to keep uh, pushing industry to make it make things safer and safer rather than have a uh, a metric which actually might be higher than than industry could could manage. Um, but I, I think the the point that you you make is a, a really important one about you know what's going to happen the first time there's a fatal crash with one of these vehicles and you know we've seen that with in the US with uh, with Uber. Um, that you know, it caused a huge amount of, of public backlash. Um, you know, I, I think one one of the uh, issues we're looking at is um, how do we ensure that we've got appropriate uh, crash investigation um, to to be able to look at the causes of any crash that take place and look at not just the immediate causes but any systemic issues that might have led to that. Um, so that, as in the case with the Uber crash, you know, did the training of the safety driver um, uh, you know, was that a contributor? You know, were the the driver monitoring systems that they had have in place um, adequate? Um, and so, I think it'll be very important to make sure that there's an ability to investigate those crashes and and look at the systemic issues that, that might be causing them. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll uh, keep going because I'm conscious of time. Um, uh, Largely at the, the end of the slides there. The, the last issue on, on vehicle generated uh, data, um, we're actually doing some broader work around uh, data that, that vehicles are capturing today and, and the potential to use that for road safety, network efficiency and, and other purposes. Um, specifically for this, where we are looking at what data is required for compliance and enforcement. And I mentioned earlier, there's international work um, both on the, the DSSAD, so the, the data safety systems for automated driving, um, but also on uh, event data recorders, so the, the black box for the vehicle. Uh, and I think those two devices are going to be really uh, critical to, to make sure that um, enforcement officers can determine who is in control um, and that we get all the data um, that we need when there, when there is a crash. Um, we are planning to have quite broad powers for the uh, for the in-service regulator to be able to go out and uh, request data from uh, from the automated driving system entity. Um, uh, amongst the, the requirements are that, that data uh, that data must be held in Australia so that um, there's, there's not um, problems with trying to access data uh, internationally, um, but pro providing quite a broad ability for that regulator to look at safety issues, to look at um, uh, the way that risks have, have been managed uh, within the organisation. So, 
that was everything that I was planning to uh, to go through. Again, just come back to our overall goal is um, to support the safe commercial deployment um, of automated vehicles to to ensure that uh, Australians can can gain the benefit of this technology. Um, so I'm conscious we are pretty much out of time, but um, you know I'm very happy to. Um, uh, take further questions if people can stay around or feel free to, to contact me if you, uh, if you did want to follow up. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you for the excellent discussion and I got excellent feedbacks during and I'm sure we will have also excellent feedbacks after. Um, thank you for being a partner and um, um, accepting my invitation and assisting us with our regulation reports. This forum also had two weeks ago a discussion with Deputy Director uh, of uh, Arizona Department of Transportation. And we see a lot of importance in sharing this experience and sharing the work that is being done with other regulators because we're all facing more or less the same problems. So thank you for being part of our community and sharing with us the amazing work that you're doing in Australia. And um, we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. And, and it'd be great to hear about uh, your own service work once you've, uh, you're further along with it and, uh, and how you've tackled the issues. Um, thanks for your time it was, and your questions. Uh, it, was, it was great to talk to you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.